как дать пацана посчитать потери Суммы нули погибают на сцене Снова один прогуляюсь без тени Заливаю лит, поцелуй на шею Э, э, как там рад Правда назад, на черный каскад Вижу твой взгляд, стель на гаяр Не мог тебя взять, но ты не моя Как дать пацана посчитать потери Суммы нули погибают на сцене Снова один прогуляюсь без тени Заливаю лит, поцелуй на шею Э, э, как там рад Назад, черный каскад Вижу твой взгляд, степь на гаяр Не мог тебя взять, но ты не моя Эти понты покупались во рту Твои мозги затупились к утру Так дайте пацанам посчитать потери Суммы нули погибают на сцене Снова один прогуляюсь без тени Заливаю лит, поцелуй на шее Э, э, как там рад Правда назад, черный каскад Вижу твой взгляд, степ на гаяк Мог тебя взять, но ты не моя Так дайте пацанам посчитать потери Суммы нули погибают Снова один прогуляюсь без тени Заливаю лит, поцелуй на шее Э, э, как там рад Правда назад, черный каскад Вижу твой взгляд, степь на гаяк Мог тебя взять, но ты не моя Дайте пацана посчитать потери Суммы нули погибают на сцене Снова один прогуляюсь без тени Заливаю лит, поцелуй на шее Э, э, как там рад Правда назад, черный каскад Вижу твой взгляд, степь на гаяр Не мог тебя взять, но ты не моя Так дайте пацана посчитать потери Суммы нули погибают на сцене Снова один прогуляюсь без тени Заливаю лит, поцелуй на шее Э, э, как там рад Назад, черный каскад Вижу твой взгляд, степь на гаяр Не мог тебя взять, но ты не моя Я немного интересно, что оба вы, Тайлер и Кейлеб, think about Trump and his next, you know, bid to become president. And is, do, you, do you expect a lot of CPI members to end up in the Trump camp? I mean, Great question. Laura, you, you kind of That's mentioned like MAGA communism, right? As it's in, a like, thing. A nonprofit, we, we don't endorse any candidate. We don't campaign for anyone. Uh, you know, we simply carry out educational socialist meetings and we educate people about socialism and anti-imperialism. We don't endorse any candidate. Yeah, well, what um, I'm kind of getting at is it's sort of like, like, like as, I, as I said in the beginning, the People's Party, a populist party with conservative beginnings, now getting people from the left attaching themselves or, you know, migrating over to the, to the party because of civil liberties issues. And do you, like, I know that a lot of Bernie supporters ended up supporting Trump in 2016. Mm. Do you see that same sort of dynamic in, in play here again as we approach the next election? I mean, I think that Joe Biden has made clear that you're with him or against him. And I think the reason that we're seeing this, I remember back during the Bush years at the protests against the war in Iraq, you would see the Libertarian Party. I remember Alex Jones. That's when I first mm -hmm. saw Alex Jones. You, know, you bet. I, he wasn't super famous like he is now, but he was walking around at the, uh, the Iraq we, war. We protests. did a big one in Austin with Alex Jones to protest the Iraq war. Right. And he's yeah. a right winger, but 
because he was against the neocons that were running the Republican Party that were the establishment, he got shoved into the same tent as, oh, you're the, you're, you're, you're part of the, the people that are against Bush. You're the left. And I think that now, now that Joe Biden and the Democratic Party and the, the, the woke synthetic left are becoming the main line of U.S. Mm. imperialism, that, you know, left critics of the American establishment and right wing critics of the American establishment are increasingly being shoved into the same <laughs> camp. Um, you know, and that doesn't mean that there aren't deep ideological differences between such groups, but they are against the the status quo. And that, right. you know, during the the final, the late Cold War, after uh, Richard Nixon, uh, you know, came into the presidency, you had like the what I call the late Cold War normal, where the Republicans were the hardline party, Reagan, Nixon, Bush, and the Democrats were kind of the loyal opposition who criticized it. And now what we're seeing is as the U.S. society is in a big crisis, that's flipped. And now the Democrats are becoming very much the party uh, that is, you know, the, the mainstream party. And it looks like I think and I actually do predict and I, this is maybe weird. You know, I wish my best to the People's Party. I, I like I like what they're doing and such in the United States. But honestly, I think there's a really good chance that give it time. It won't happen immediately. But I, I'm almost wondering if in a decade or so we might have a Republican Party that's just kind of a catch all populist anti-establishment party mm. uh, that's kind of that what trump be. started you know that's what he was yeah. trying to build when he basically did a hostile takeover of the gop right. kicked out the neocons from power and and the mega people took over the republican party but my question for you is do you have some trump supporters in cpi well i mean i think there there were there are people in in cpi that voted for <laughs> trump you know i mean yeah. i i, I, I could give my thoughts about that so yeah you know, there are there are people, I mean, you know, Tyler campaigned for Obama, you know, I mean, well, yeah. I, I'm I, surrounded I, by Trump supporters everywhere. My mom, well, I shouldn't, but you get what I'm saying. <laughs> dad, I think we can put dad in. Actually, this is the politics where I'm at. My dad, when he went to vote, he wouldn't mind me telling this story. Uh, the sheriff was in front of me, in front of him, and they were voting for Hillary Clinton. And uh, some other guy he didn't like behind him was voting for Donald Trump. And my dad goes, screw it. I hate both of you. I'm voting for Jill Stein. So he literally <laughs> made up his mind in in the line. OK, that's great. so that's my dad. Um, I, I will just tell you my my and your audience, Maverick News audience. Hear this from a conservative communist. The depth of my hatred for Justin Trudeau, for Joe <laughs> Biden, <laughs> for Hillary Clinton, for Victoria Newland is so deep and pure that I must turn to Christianity and pray for their souls. Okay. Solidarity. I with pray that. for them to find Jesus <laughs> because I'm afraid of myself if I don't. Okay. Yes. I pray that they find the Lord. I pray for you, Nancy Pelosi. Obviously God's on your side with your stock choices. So maybe he can be Amen. on your side with, uh, you know, your foreign policy choices as well, or your neoliberal uh, crash the economy uh anyway so you know that being said i love to see trump make him go crazy i love it oh it me makes too me happy me too okay? did you see what trump I, said about the war just yesterday i love it no me no too. chomsky said it he's the only anti-war voice in the upper crust of american politics here i'll really? show you if you haven't seen it this is like 30 seconds of uh, uh yesterday i believe this is in uh, West Palm Beach. What are going to do weekend? to stop the war in Ukraine? So I would uh, literally start calling, not from the day I took over, but from the night I won. And I called two people. You know who the two people are? Putin, right? You know who Putin is? And Zelensky. And I'd say, we're going to meet. We're going to meet. <laughs> and I would, I, I guarantee I could work that out. I guarantee. I know exactly what I'd say, by the way. I know exactly. I tell one guy this, and I tell one guy that, and I say, you better make a deal. We would have a deal made in 24 hours. What going to do to stop the war? Well, look, Trump is selfish. Trump, Trump 
is a selfish politician. And because he's selfish, he doesn't, he's not, you know, playing ball the way he's supposed to. He wants to be remembered as a great president. He wants his ego to, to be, uh, you know, to be, you know, I, I guess flattered and supported. And I think a lot of the good things Trump did when he was president were done for that reason, that he's just too egotistical to be a team player for U.S. imperialism. You know, when he's, when he went to North Korea and met with Kim Jong-un, that was an amazing moment. That was a huge step forward. And we know now that while Mike Pompeo was for it, uh, that John Bolton was trying to sabotage it. And John Bolton admits this. He's written a book saying so, uh, saying that he was trying to sabotage it. And while while the negotiations were in the works, the the Spanish, uh, the embassy of North Korea in Spain was raided. Did you hear about this? And it was all over the news in Spain that, that, that all kinds of people that the Spanish mainstream media said were linked to American intelligence, linked to, uh, you know, to American corporations and businesses, broke into the North Korean embassy and stole computers and smashed the place. And that was like an effort to try and derail the talks. John mm. Bolton gave an interview where he said with North Korea, Libyan options are on the table, meaning that they would do to Kim Jong-un what was done to Gaddafi. And John Bolton mm. admits he was trying to sabotage and prevent Trump from making peace on the Korean Peninsula. Well, do I think that Trump was trying to make peace on the Korean Peninsula because he's just a good guy? No, but Trump wanted to be remembered as a great American leader. You know, one thing that, that struck me about Donald Trump is I, I, I feel like, you know, when Donald Trump was a young guy, Nixon was president. And in some ways, the Trump presidency was this weird attempt to reenact the, 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 the Nixon presidency, right? Because what did Nixon do? He went to China and he met with Mao. So Trump went to North Korea. He met with Kim Jong-un. Uh, also, what did, uh, what did Nixon do? He called himself the law and order candidate. Donald Trump called himself the law and order candidate. You know, Nixon said he spoke for the silent majority. Trump says he spoke for the silent majority. Um, you know, Roger Stone, who was a big part of Trump and his campaign, was also a big part of Nixon and his campaign. And I feel like, you know, maybe when young Donald Trump had presidential aspirations and was, you know, you know, in his mind writing, what will I do when I be president? Uh, he was looking at then President Richard Nixon and thinking, you know, I can be like mm. that someday or something. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, the, the parallels there are kind of interesting. Um, it was an the interesting other... hybrid, sort of like a hybrid Nixon Reagan, you know, tack that he took. I mean, mm -hmm. Reagan, I, I see in a little bit of a different light. I mean, Reagan, you know, Reagan, I mean, maybe in the sense of like the Reagan campaign and how Reagan was kind of leading a revolt against Carter. Right. And you could see that as kind of the Obama administration and Brzezinski and some of their policies like, you know, he was riding that same kind of reaction among the business community against, you know, some degrowth and bad economic management. Um, but the other thing is that you let's remember that Nixon was impeached. Right. And and I mean, he wasn't you know, I mean, they, he resigned before the impeachment process continued. But uh, but and if you look at that, part of the reason that, that Nixon was impeached was that he got to be too powerful. Um, you know, Nixon was brought into office because they needed a strong man to get the country back in order because the students were protesting the Vietnam War. The black community was in revolt. The USA was losing in Vietnam and they needed somebody to come in there and just bring the hammer down. Mm. And so Nixon did in the service of American capitalism and imperialism. He escalated the Vietnam War. And then when it became clear they couldn't win, he pulled out. Right. Uh, you know, and uh, Nixon. You know, you know, the the previous administrations, Ramsey Clark, who I used to work for, had been trying to restrain the FBI. Nixon came in there. He fired Ramsey Clark. He said to the FBI, go get him. He let the FBI go after the Black Panthers and crush them. Uh, and uh, Nixon was a, a ruthless strong man. And he brought the United States back into order. He ended the political crisis. He brought young people back into mainstream politics, lowered the voting age to 18. He, he did a lot of dramatic things to try and stabilize the United States. And then he succeeded. And then the very forces that brought him into office removed him because they don't like mm -hmm. they don't like the strong men. These Bonapartists, they're Bonapartists are a lot like dentists. You know, you don't like going to the dentist, but you do it when you have to. Right. And that, <laughs> that you know, that they bring in these kind of strong man authoritarian leaders to try and save their system. But at the end of the day, the rich and powerful don't want anyone who can say no to them and mm -hmm. that. That in order to do what he did, you know, there was a TV show on TV when Nixon was president called uh, called All in the Family. And the hero, or oh, yeah. the hero was Archie Bunker. Archie Bunker was a working class guy. Right. And and Nixon had this layer of working class guys who backed him. And Richard Nixon, let's remember, he advocated up until his second term, up into his second term. He was calling for a guaranteed minimum income for all mm -hmm. citizens. Did you know this? 
And, yes. and he wanted to give every family with children, he wanted to give them a, a, a cash income. Well, I mean, I, I mean, like other than Andrew Yang, nobody calls right. it. There was an attempt at it. UBI. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, and that um, that yeah, he was happy to unleash neoliberal economics on Chile after the coup, you know, that mm -hmm. happened. But he was not willing, you know. He kicked Milton Friedman out of the White House. Milton Friedman was his economic advisor for the first year, and then the economy <laughs> tanked, and he said, "We're all we're all Keynesians now." And he booted Milton Friedman out of there, um, and he and he imposed the Nixon shocks, a, a wage freeze, a price freeze. Uh, he imposed the Nixon shocks and 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 took dramatic economic moves to stabilize the economy. And when he was ousted, uh, you know, that presidency uh, that, that came after him, Gerald Ford, the president no one ever voted for, Gerald Ford. Mm -hmm. Gerald Ford, first of all, uh, what did he do? He brought Ayn Rand to the White House uh, along with uh, along with her protege, Alan Greenspan. And it's Gerald Ford who got us Alan Greenspan. And it's also Gerald Ford who got us uh, who got us Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld. And neoliberalism got a huge boost when Nixon was ousted. Um, and that, you know, Nixon, because he was an authoritarian strongman and because he was like Trump, he was a selfish politician. He wasn't willing to play ball with with neoliberal economics, despite being a conservative. Uh, and he was replaced with with Gerald Ford, who very much would do that. Um, so Nixon was somebody who was, you know, who was somebody who came in to save capitalism. He did it. And then they removed him uh, in order to bring in somebody who would help grind the country into poverty. And, uh, and yeah, you know was, why they removed him? Because he was looking into that whole Bay of Pigs thing. Mm, that'll do we it. We know what that means, don't we? They got six ways from Sunday to get rid of you, Lori Spencer. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I would just like to say about Trump, uh, I love that he pisses off the libs. But I don't think he's got the answers for how to fix things. That's the thing is I appreciate he makes their heads explode. I love that. I I mean, I pray their heads don't explode. Right. But <laughs> you get what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I woke up in the middle of the night the other night. I'm a school teacher. I make thirty five grand a year. OK. Missouri just passed some law to uh, they raised the base pay to thirty eight grand a year. So I actually got uh, an, an extra paycheck. God provided. That's the main way I was able to get to the anti-war rally this weekend. But I wake up. I look through my YouTube feed. Donald Trump's on Forbes. Something about education. So I click on it. And Donald Trump is just spitting hot fire about how the school teachers in this country. Oh, we're going to get them straight. We're going to take away their tenure. Well, I'm pretty sure the history of tenure in America was McCarthyism, right? Mm -hmm. so Good i mean point. i'm making 35 grand a year you teach five years you get that little bit of stability you get to keep a teacher like me in the classroom you guys think about it think about your english teacher who do you think would be more fun to be in a classroom with okay i just mm -hmm. hate to say it we're reading 1984 in my journalism class and Good. i'm relating it to every single thing happening in the news right now their memory hall we watched biden's speech and then I said, did you guys notice he just memory, he just memory hold every single thing that's happened in the Donbass for the past 10 years? How about you didn't mention that once? Oh, so he I'm was making those lying like a rug in that speech. And Donald Trump's going to replace my tenure with merit based pay. Now, who's going to decide the merit? You're going to you're going to pay me based off test scores. These tests are a joke. A joke. And the thing is, you want to blame the school teachers, Donald. There's never been any litter boxes in my bathroom and maybe in <laughs> urban areas of the country. We'll focus on urban areas then. Go in the Democratic strongholds and clear them out. But in, in the rural America, are you look at my fancy studio. Look at this. Look at this. Isn't this fancy? Look, there's fertilizer back here. I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in the basement of the bank, like this rented apartment that I live. OK, I got two kids. My wife's upstairs. We just bought pizza. I was thank God I could afford it. All right. And you want to go after me, Donald. Donald, I can make twice. I, I work on the weekend as a pharmacy tech at Walmart and make videos about it on my YouTube channel so I can somehow pay off the sixty thousand dollar debt that I got to get a master's degree in journalism from the University of Missouri. Not a good career choice, Rick, if you want to make money. <laughs> if you get lucky, but you can. You and can you know, you're and right. Scream into the void, but I could drive a truck. I should join the truckers. I'd make twice as much money. 
Hell yeah, you yeah, but would. But here's my analysis why Donald Trump does that. He wants to go after people like Nancy Pelosi. He wants to go after rich Democrats in the suburbs, but they got money. And he knows that's going to be very difficult. He wants to go after the media. He would love to go in MSNBC and just make their lives a living hell. But he can't do that. So he like reaches around for like, what? What profession can I go after that's kind of like Democrats? Ooh, teachers. Teachers. Let's turn the screws the on unions, teachers. The teachers' unions are so strongly and it's obvious, democratic. obvious, like, dude, we're trying to get a teachers' union going. It's not easy. It's In not Missouri, easy. I'm it, sure it ain't. Like, most people are like, nope. Most teachers are like, nope. I get summers off. I ain't got no interest in the union. 35 grand is fine for me. I mean, it's, a, it's an uphill battle. So that's the thing mm. with Donald. I love that he pisses off the libs, but I don't think he's got the answers of how to fix the problems for the working class in America. And I think Caleb does. If you listen to Caleb, if you listen to our four point plan that we put out through the CPI, that's how to give the working class what they want in this country. And dare I say, some of the communists have the ideas about what you want. Okay. God created the earth. God put the oil in the ground. And I don't think on the eighth day he said, all right, Mr. Rockefeller, you can have all of it. <laughs> so true. And, you know, I just wanted to play this uh, very brief 60 second clip of President Kennedy because something Caleb said really rang a bell with me. And he's absolutely right that, you know, if a president doesn't please the deep state, they remove him. Through Nixon, it was impeachment. Trump, they impeached him twice. They didn't remove him, but they impeached him twice, once on the way out the door. Uh, same with Bill Clinton, impeached but not removed from office. But, you know, they find a way to destroy you, whether it's through character assassination, impeachment, or in the case of President Kennedy, actual assassination. You have to ask yourself, why? Did they take it to that extreme with the Kennedy brothers and the president of the United States, John Kennedy, later his brother, Senator Robert Kennedy, when he was challenging Nixon in 1968 for the presidency? Why didn't they just use all that sexual blackmail that Hoover had on JFK to destroy him? Why didn't they find something to impeach him over? Why did they go to the ultimate extreme of assassination? in broad daylight, high noon, on a Dallas street, so that the whole world could see it. And they wanted the whole world to see it. And when they came back to Washington that night, his wife, the First Lady, Jacqueline Kennedy, refused to change her little pink dress, which was smeared with the blood of her husband. And many times on the flight back to Washington from Texas, she was asked, you know, would you like to change your blood-stained clothes? And she said, no, no, I want them to see what they did to Jack. What they did to Jack. And so here's 60 seconds of a speech that President Kennedy gave to the United Auto Workers Union. This was May 8th of 1962. It was when he was having that confrontation with Big Steel because they were trying to increase steel prices, which would have completely tanked the economy. Uh, and he was fighting back against the most powerful interests in America. The president of the United States. And, uh, that, uh, what, uh, and who believed that the president of the United States should be the honorary chairman of a great fraternal organization and confine himself to ceremonial functions. But that isn't what the Constitution says. And I did not run for President of the United States to fulfill that uh, office in that way. Harry Truman once said there are 14 or 15 million Americans who have the resources to have representatives in Washington to protect their interests. And that the interests of the great mass of the other people, the 150 or 60 million, is the responsibility of the President of the United States. And I propose to fulfill it. Too close to what the people wanted, Lori. I also understand he wanted to make the moon mission. 
uh, a joint operation between the Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, and he proposed combining the space programs, which would have been a huge step toward uh, toward peace in the world. And yeah, that would have been amazing. That's what I think it was. He wanted to make peace with the Soviet Union. The other thing that's that's interesting is, you know, at that time, uh, you have to remember. So, you know, this was what they call the post-World War II economic expansion, which is the greatest episode of ec economic growth in all of human history. Uh, you know, in at the Soviet Union, the communist countries, they were all rebuilding from World War II. Uh, in Western Europe, they were having social democracies where they were enacting free health care and, you know, free education and such. And, and across the third world, many of the U.S. aligned governments, uh, you know, were these kind of military dictatorships that were aligned with the United States. And the Kennedy administration, they saw, like, for example, uh, the leader, um, Sigmund Rhee in South Korea, he was overthrown. Uh, there was an uprising against him because South Korea was still very poor. And so the Kennedy administration and later the Johnson administration, they arranged for Park Chung-hee to become the new military dictator. And he started economically developing the country. Uh, and the Shah of Iran, who was a U.S.-backed dictator, the, the Kennedy administration basically forced him to have something called the White Revolution, to start redistributing land, uh, to give women the right to vote, et cetera. Um, and the Kennedy administration basically said, in order to fight communists, we have to allow countries to kind of build themselves up economically. We have to create a space for countries like South Korea, for countries like Iran to have uh, their own economy so they don't have communist revolutions. Um, and that was a much a more effective strategy. And, you know, the creation of the Peace Corps, that's Kennedy's credited for doing that. That was also part of that. You know, Hugo Chavez talked about when he was a kid, the, the Peace Corps volunteers taught him to play basketball in his neighborhood in Venezuela. You know, they came to his neighborhood and that, that creating the Peace Corps, uh, allowing U.S. aligned countries to kind of build up their infrastructure. Uh, that was that was his way of fighting the communists. That doesn't make as much money for the military industrial complex as just bombing the shit out of country. <laughs> uh, just true. like Jesus wanted. Yeah, it's, it's it, you know, it, it's actually quite expensive. And for years, I believe in the New York Times, there was a columnist throughout the 70s and 80s that was always saying, why can't we be the communists? In Nicaragua, the communists are teaching people to read. They're opening free health care clinics. The way to defeat communists is we have to be the communists. We have to teach people to read. We have to we have to provide health care to people. We have to help these countries develop. And if we could just do what the Soviets did, then no one would want to be communist. Well, the reason that they don't do it is because of capitalism and imperialism. You know, it's not set up to function that way. But that was kind mm -hmm. of the Cold War liberal attitude is that if we right. if we can really live out our liberal principles, we can stop the communists from expanding. And I think mm -hmm. Kennedy really believed that to some degree or other. He wasn't a communist, but he believed that. You have to also remember that, you know, Kennedy's administration came not very long after Roosevelt and Roosevelt had been elected four times. Um, you know, um, if I'm not mistaken, there was an interview with with I think it was Bobby Kennedy, uh, you know, where he was interviewed and they asked Bobby Kennedy, you know, do you believe in term limits? Because after Roosevelt had died, then they enacted term limits. So now only two terms for a president. Mm -hmm. And Bobby Kennedy said, oh, sure, I believe in, uh, in, in term limits. And my brother, Ted, he believes in term limits also. And and, uh, you know, he started just naming off his relatives and they believe in term limits. And, they, and this other guy believes in term limits. And that was the thing the Kennedy's if they wanted to, they could keep running the United States as a political dynasty for a long time. And that I think ultimately what scared them the most was that Kennedy became positioned himself as an ally of the civil rights movement, because what made yes. Roosevelt so powerful was that he had positioned himself as an ally of the labor unions. It was his alliance with the labor unions, with the Communist Party that had gotten him that energy and gotten him that ability to do all kinds of things that scared the ruling class. So Kennedy, this new president comes along, he's the first Catholic president and he comes in and he's you know, got a different attitude about how to fight the commies. And then on top of that, uh, you know, when it gets down to it, he's, he's you know, positioning himself as aligned with this protest movement. I think the ruling elite of the United States said, this guy's gotta go, this guy's That's gotta right. go. That's and right. That's, and, you know, I just yeah. wanted to say, uh, because you brought up term limits and the 22nd Amendment, just this week, I ran a poll on Twitter asking if we should repeal the 22nd Amendment if it was a mistake. Uh, as you probably know, in 1947, the Congress, which was controlled, finally, the Republicans mm -hmm. won Congress back after a generation of the Democrats having a firm control over both the White House and the Congress. But in 1947, that changed. And after two years after the death of Roosevelt, they passed the 22nd Amendment, instituting a two-term limit for presidents to ensure 
that we never had another mm -hmm. FDR and that the Republicans would never be out of power again for a generation. Mm -hmm. So to me, it seems very anti-democratic to mm -hmm. have term limits, both on the presidency and on Congress. I'm against term limits because I believe yeah. that that subverts the <laughs> will of the electorate. What if you get a good guy in there? Exactly. I mean, yeah. let's look at this from a private business. If you run a business, do, <laughs> get do rid you, of Steve Jobs. It's you want to get years. rid of Steve, out, Steve Jobs after eight You're years? Out. You're <laughs> out, Elon. <laughs> you want to get well, rid of your best guy after eight years? I mean, you want to sign that guy to a hey, lifetime maybe Bill contract. Gates, though. I, I'm, I'm for it in the case of Bill Gates. And that's Eight literally what the American people did with FDR. FDR was supported by a vast majority of the electorate, not just Democrats. Republicans voted for him as well. He always won by very large margins. He was clearly the choice of the people. At that time, they felt he was the right leader for the United States, and they gave him an unprecedented four terms in office. Now, granted, it's been a very long time since we had a president that the vast majority, Republicans and Democrats, could agree was great for the country and wanted to keep him. I can't even think of the last time that a Demo or that any candidate or president had that kind of support. But like you said, Tyler, what if we get a good guy or a Henry good guy Wallace. in that office? What if we get a Wallace or a Kennedy or someone we actually want to keep? Um, so I asked. I, I threw the question out there just out of curiosity. Uh, Can, polled about wanna, 300 people. I want to interview uh, Rick. Rick's got that great broadcast face. Doesn't He's he, the though? strong, silent type. He is. You see those Not wheels always. just turning. <laughs> Maybe it's because you, you talk so much on the other part, Rick. You just you just sit back and listen. I'm well, let, me, let me tell We're you. So here. I, we I, I interview, listen a lot. And don't we got to get like Rick in there. What's your thoughts, Rick? Well, I mean, I'm I'm pretty conservative, so I'm uh, I'm sitting here with three pretty violent judgment <laughs> left left wingy kind of people, so um, I'm a little outnumbered. I I, I, I I'm, a little, I'm a little afraid of you because I'm afraid you might change my mind about things. Oh no! <laughs> oh. I, prom <laughs> I promise uh, I won't. Uh, you know, I I have concerns about coercion. I like people to be able to make their own choices. Uh, do Absolutely. things voluntarily. I, I I do believe in the in the free market, mm -hmm. um, but I, I I share a lot of your concerns about people being left behind and and things of that nature. But I I view the all economies around the world as being hybrid systems. Mm -hmm. There's no pure free market. There's no there's nothing pure anywhere really. And I, I see more similarities between countries than things that are, that are different. Um, so well, I, I'm, I'm sort of, I, I view myself as being kind of middle of the road, but maybe pretty conservative in a lot of ways. I get so, you, you know, but I, and I'm, I really, I get very concerned about communism, mm -hmm. anything authoritarian, Coercion. because I see that if you, through government programs and regulation, there's always coercion mm -hmm. and that can lead to a very bad place. And I think we've seen that during the pandemic and the attitude the government took toward yeah. vaccinations. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm responsible for the protection of everyone around me instead of being responsible for myself as an individual. So to me, it's upside down. When right. you start getting into that kind of thinking, yeah, I get really worried about it. Yeah. So I sit back and I listen to what you guys have to say, but uh, I'm really more interested in listening to to, to absorb than well, you know, pe people on this show listen to me talk all the time. So <laughs> um, I, I'm I'm happy to have you guys share your thoughts. I, I never want to engage in an argument at all because I'm still figuring this stuff out myself. But I do like to share like kind of light bulb moments I had. Uh, and Caleb helped with a lot of those, you know, with like coercion. It's like the, the, the way Marx looks at it is as long as there's scarcity, people are going to fight over stuff, you know, and it's kind of like as long as people are fighting over stuff, there's probably going to be a government of some kind, I feel. And that government, in a way, is going to be coercive in some way. But the Marxist idea is as well as I understand it, and Caleb can help me out, is that there's going to be one of two classes in charge of that government. In America, the bourgeoisie is in charge of our government, 
or if you don't like that term, the ultra wealthy, the Davos crowd the is 1%. in charge of the government. And they will crush the 99% if need be to keep They're crushing us right rent. now. To keep to keep my student loan payment coming, baby, because we never even touched that principle in 10 straight years. And they like it that way, Tyler. Pat you on the head. Let's get all you smart little people in debt forever. OK, it's a good business model. We don't create bullet trains or anything like that. But hey, our pockets keep getting full. And I like that the communists are just straight with it. If you read page one of the, the Chinese Constitution, it says we are a dictatorship of the proletariat. And that sounds terrifying until you learn what it is. Mm -hmm. And that means everybody in Davos, listen up. There's a new game in town, y'all. The 99% <laughs> is now in charge. And we will crush you if need be. If you try to screw up our lives by kicking us off our little family homes. Okay. Or enslaving us in debt forever. Okay. Or making us use your satanic digital currency. We've got a nice prison cell for you. Okay. Hell yeah. That's the dictatorship of the proletariat. And okay? isn't that the same and, thing as we the people? We the Doesn't people. Doesn't that mean the, government the same of the thing people that's by in our the Declaration of Independence? People. Ain't no Bill Gates going to screw up my kid's life. And I will die to prevent you from doing it to me, Bill Gates. Me and Jesus Christ will. Okay. So Jesus gets me out of bed in the morning. Jesus helps me pray for Nancy Pelosi. And Marxism gives me the materialist tools to build the government that will prevent Bill Gates from driving my teenage daughter to suicide. Just as like, what is it? One in three girls with a social media account want to kill themselves. Did you guys see that article? Wow. So, you know, and Marx actually had a way to start to eliminate scarcity, which I, I think China is kind of doing. You set the means of production free. Right. And Caleb, you take it from there because I'm I'm gonna start well getting out of my depth. I, I wanna I wanna point out something, which is this argument against coercion, right? And it's I think the libertarians call it the non-aggression principle, right? Yeah, yeah you know, th there's a problem with it, which uh, is you have to imagine. You ever play King of the Mountain when you're a kid, where it's like you're you're pushing to, to get to the top of the hill. Well, imagine that you suddenly changed the rules of the game and there was no pushing allowed. One kid got to the top and he said, oh, now we can't push anymore. <laughs> All the richest people in the world have acquired their wealth through brute force. And this is, you know, defenders of capitalism always make it sound like, oh, they were just, you know, inventors. Tinkering they were just lucky. <laughs> but but the way <laughs> the luck. whole origin of capitalism I mean, you talk about the transcontinental slave trade. You talk about how this country was acquired from the Native Americans. Even in Europe, you talk about the clearing of the commons and how the, you know, they threw the peasants off the land and made the land into private property. How when they just when they after they stole the land from the Native Americans in the United States, they then they then gave most of it to railroad companies and, and oil companies. They didn't they didn't just give it to every every white American based on, you know, whatever their merit or something. It was, you know, that capitalism as a system began with a huge amount of forceful, violent theft. And the 1% the of today can trace their roots straight back to the 1% that, that took power uh, with the overthrow of feudalism. I mean, it, it is it is the same circles of wealth and power, uh, the same, you know, the same, you know, I mean, who were, you know, at the time the United States was being founded, they had a, something in Virginia. They had a group called the House of the Burgesses. You ever heard of this? The House mm -hmm. of the Burgesses. Do you know what, you know, Burgess is? That's the English version of the word bourgeois. You know, it was the landowners, it was the slave plantation owners. And that's who, you know, who were coming together to form the American government, the Burgesses, the landowners, the property class. Right. And that uh, that that capitalism began with a huge amount of violent theft and it uses state coercion and violent theft uh, to carry out its operations to this day, whether it's, you know, invading Iraq <laughs> and, you know, the prison industrial complex and all of that. So if if we just suddenly. No, now no one can use force for anything. Mm -hmm. How does that fix things? Uh, everything is already in the hands of a small group of well, people. I everything. I mean, it, it, it's it's not a real solution, right? You know, uh, in an ideal world, yes, we want to create a society. And this is to, to get to Tyler's question. We want to create a society where there is so much wealth and abundance that people can just live their lives as they want from each according to their own ability to each according to their mm -hmm. needs. Do what you feel like doing. Take what you need. A post-scarcity society. The only way you can have that is there's enough to go around. And that mm -hmm. means eliminating capitalism because the problem with capitalism, the real fundamental problem with capitalism 
is that the more wealth that gets created under capitalism, the poorer people get. Self-driving yep. cars should be yep. a great thing, but under capitalism, it would be a nightmare. You know, I I, uh, I I give many examples of this. You know, the coal miners riddle. The father says, you know, to the son says to the father, why is it so cold? And the father says, because, you know, I can't afford any coal to heat the stove. And he says, why can't you afford any coal to heat the stove? He says, because I lost my job at the coal mine. And he says, well, father, why did you lose your job at the coal mine? He said, because there's too much coal. Poverty created by abundance. That is the uniqueness of the capitalist system. And, and that's why we have the boom bust cycle. I mean, John Maynard mm. Keynes, the capitalist economist, he called it underconsumption. The Karl Marx called it what it actually is, which is overproduction. The worker can never afford to buy back what he produces. He's always driving the worker to produce more products than there is wages paid out for the worker to buy back what he produces. So you're you're frequently going to have a boom bust cycle. And when capitalism was first getting going, it happened every couple of years, every two, three years, they would have a panic. And then they invented all kinds of mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Federal Reserve Bank and all kinds of mechanisms to try and stabilize it, but they still couldn't get over yep. this problem. And we had World War One, which came after a number of you know financial meltdowns and breakdowns. Great then we had World War Two that came after the, the Great grapes Depression. of wrath. Yeah. And now, as a result of you know the technological achievements that, that that have happened, the computer revolution, we are in a long term capitalist crisis because the technology has taken such a huge leap that the elimination of the worker at the assembly line is something that that's like never been seen before right i mean they mm -hmm. don't need workers right now i yep. mean you talk about what is it this new thing chat ai or whatever yep. you know, mm -hmm. chat you know, GPT. I, right and in a rational socialist economy, this would be tremendous. It would just mean there's less work for everyone to do. We can, though, you know, the work that does need to be done, we can we can assign it, and, and it would. We be can better. meet our I, deadlines I a can, lot faster. Yeah. Yeah. I can tell you guys don't live in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> well, mean? let me let me say we one quick thing. <laughs> let me say one more quick thing about coercion, Rick. And I was thinking about this when I knew I was going to come on here. That the truckers had their bank accounts seized, right? Not all of them, but, but they some, froze, some, they of froze them some bank accounts for a time. Okay. Yeah. So I would, that's coercion. I would mm. prefer to live in a Christian anarchist uh, society where no one ever does anything like that to each other. There's, there's sure. no greed or use of I don't know force. what that has to do with capitalism. That's, uh, that's a, a well, tool of war. It's economic warfare waged oh, upon yeah, no, the people. Oh, yeah, no, that's what but, I mean. Yeah, and, yeah. and you know, until we can, until everyone can find the Lord and we can treat each other the way we deserve to be treated, I find I would love to see the trucker that had their bank account get seized get to face the banker that seized their bank account, just hmm. like I would my own children. You know, if one of my kids hits another one, we're going to have to take them aside and we're going to have to explain that that hurts people when that's done to you, okay? And I would like to get that banker in front of a courtroom and be mm -hmm. like, listen, sir, if you treat those working class truckers that way, you're going to have your bank account seized and you have a mighty big one, sir. And those <laughs> bankers were ordered to do what they did by the government. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. why they seized And who's, whose side is that government on? It's the side of the ultra wealthy. It's not on the side mm -hmm. of the working class.